Article on Pope Leo X by Clemens Loeffler from the Catholic Encyclopedia, 1913. This is recorded to celebrate the tenth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug Leo X, Pope, Giovanni de' Medici, born at Florence, 11th of December, 1475, died at Rome, 1st of December, 1521 was the second son of Lorenzo the Magnificent, 1469-1492, to 1492, and Clarice Orsini, and from his earliest youth was destined for the church. He received tonsure in 1482, and in 1483 was made abbot of font douce in the French diocese of Saintes, and appointed apostolic prothonotary by Sixtus IV. All the benefices which the Medici could obtain were at his disposal. He consequently became possessed of the rich abbey of Passignano in 1484, and in 1486 of Monte Cassino. Owing to the constant pressure brought to bear by Lorenzo and his envoys, Innocent VIII, in 1489, created the thirteen-year-old child a cardinal, on condition that he should dispense with the insignia and the privileges of his office for three years. Meanwhile his education was completed by the most distinguished humanists and scholars, Angelo Poliziano, Marsilio Ficino, and Bernardo de Vizzi, later Cardinal Bibbiena. From 1489 to 1491, Giovanni de' Medici studied theology and canon law at Pisa under Filippo Decio and Bartolomeo Sozzini. On 9th of March 1492, at Fiesole, he was invested with the insignia of a cardinal, and on the 22nd of March entered Rome. The next day the Pope received him in consistory with the customary ceremonies. The Romans found the youthful cardinal more mature than his age might warrant them to expect. His father sent him an impressive letter of advice, marked by good sense and knowledge of human nature, besides bearing witness to the high and virtuous sentiments to which the elder Lorenzo returned towards the end of his life. In this letter he enjoins upon his son certain rules of conduct, and admonishes him to be honourable, virtuous, and exemplary, the more so as the College of Cardinals at that time was deficient in these good qualities. In the very next month, Lorenzo's death recalled the Cardinal to Florence. He returned once more to Rome for the papal election, which resulted, very much against his approval, in the elevation of the unworthy Alexander the Sixth after which Giovanni remained in Florence from August 1492 until the expulsion of the Medici in 1494, when he fled from his native city in the habit of a Franciscan monk. After several fruitless attempts to restore the supremacy of his family, he went on a long journey through Germany, Holland, and France, from which he returned to Rome in 1500. There, in keeping with the habits of his family, he led the life of a literary and artistic amateur, patronage, liberality, and poor financial administration frequently reduced him, even then, to distressing straits. Indeed, he remained a bad manager to the last. But though his manner of life was quite worldly, he excelled in dignity, propriety, and irreproachable conduct most of the cardinals. Towards the end of the pontificate of Julius II, 1503 to 1513, fortune once more smiled on Giovanni de' Medici, in August 1511, the Pope was dangerously ill, and the Medici Cardinal already aspired to the succession. In October 1511, he became legate in Bologna and Romagna, and cherished the hope that his family would again rule in Florence. The Florentines had taken part of the schismatic Pisans, for which reason the Pope supported the Medici. Meanwhile, the Cardinal suffered another reverse. The army, Spanish and Papal, with which he was sojourning, was defeated in 1512 at Ravenna by the French, and he was taken prisoner. But it was a Pyrrhic victory, for the French soon lost all their possessions in Italy, and the Cardinal, who was to have been taken to France, succeeded in making his escape. The supremacy of the Medici in Florence was re-established in September 1512, and this unexpected change in the fortunes of his family was only the prelude to higher honours. 
Julius II died on the 21st of February, 1513, and on the 11th of March, Giovanni de' Medici, then but 38 years old, was elected Pope. In the first scrutiny, he received only one vote. His adherents, the younger cardinals, held back his candidacy until the proper moment. The election met with approval even in France, although here and there a natural misgiving was felt as to whether the youthful Pope would prove equal to his burden. In many quarters, high hopes were placed in him by politicians who relied on his pliancy, by scholars and artists, of whom he was already a patron, and by theologians who looked for energetic church reforms under a pacific ruler. Unfortunately, he realised the hopes only of the artists, literati and worldlings who looked upon the papal court as a centre of amusement. Leo's personal appearance has been perpetuated for us in Raphael's celebrated picture at the Pitti Gallery in Florence, which represents him with the Cardinals Medici and Rossi. He was not a handsome man. His fat, shiny, effeminate countenance with weak eyes protrudes in the picture from under a close-fitting cap. The unwieldy body is supported by thin legs. His movements were sluggish, and during ecclesiastical functions his corpulence made him constantly wipe the perspiration from his face and hands, to the distress of the bystanders. But when he laughed or spoke, the unpleasant impression vanished. He had an agreeable voice, knew how to express himself with elegance and vivacity, and his manner was easy and gracious. Let us enjoy the papacy since God has given it to us, he is said to have remarked after his election. The Venetian ambassador, who related this of him, was not unbiased, nor was he in Rome at the time. Nevertheless, the phrase illustrates fairly the Pope's pleasure-loving nature and the lack of seriousness that characterised him. He paid no attention to the dangers threatening the papacy, and gave himself up unrestrainedly to amusements that were provided in lavish abundance. He was possessed by an insatiable love of pleasure, a distinctive tray of his family. Music, the theatre, art and poetry appealed to him as to any pampered worldling. Though temperate himself, he loved to give banquets and expensive entertainments, accompanied by revelry and carousing, and notwithstanding his indolence, he had a strong passion for the chase, which he conducted every year on the largest scale. From his youth he was an enthusiastic lover of music, and attracted to his court the most distinguished musicians. At table he enjoyed hearing improvisations, and though it is hard to believe, in view of his dignity and his artistic tastes, the fact remains that he enjoyed also the flat and absurd jokes of buffoons. Their loose speech and incredible appetites delighted him. In ridicule and caricature he was himself a master. Pageantry, dear to the pleasure-seeking Romans, bullfights and the like, were not neglected. Every year he amused himself during the carnivals with masks, music, theatrical performances, dances and races. Even during the troubled years of 1520 and 1521, he kept up this frivolous life. In 1520, he took part in unusually brilliant festivities. Theatrical representations, with agreeable music and graceful dancing, were his favourite diversions. The Papal Palace became a theatre, and the Pope did not hesitate to attend such improper plays as the immoral Calendra by Bibiena and Ariosto's indecent Suppositi. His contemporaries all praised and admired Leo's unfailing good temper, which he never entirely lost, even in adversity and trouble. Himself cheerful, he wished to see others cheerful. He was good-natured and liberal, and never refused a favour, either to his relatives and fellow Florentines, who flooded Rome and seized upon all official positions, or to the numerous other petitioners, artists and poets. His generosity was boundless, nor was his pleasure in giving a pose or desire for vainglory. It came from the heart. He never was ostentatious, and attached no importance to ceremonial. He was lavish in works of charity. Convents, hospitals, discharged soldiers, poor students, pilgrims, exiles, cripples, the blind, the sick, the unfortunate of every description were generously remembered, and more than six thousand ducats were annually distributed in alms. Under such circumstances, it is not surprising that the large treasure left by Julius II was entirely dissipated in two years. 
in the spring of 1515 the exchequer was empty, and Leo never after recovered from his financial embarrassment. Various doubtful and reprehensible methods were resorted to for raising money. He created new offices and dignities, and most exalted places were put up for sale. Jubilees and indulgences were degraded almost entirely into financial transactions, yet without avail, as the treasury was ruined. The Pope's income amounted to between 500,000 and 600,000 ducats. The papal household alone, which Julius II had maintained on 48,000 ducats, now cost double that sum. In all, Leo spent about 4.5 million ducats during his pontificate, and left the debt amounting to 400,000 ducats. On his unexpected death, his creditors faced financial ruin. A lampoon proclaimed that Leo X had consumed three pontificates, the treasure of Julius II, the revenues of his own reign, and those of his successor. It is proper, however, to pay full credit to the good qualities of Leo. He was highly cultivated, susceptible to all that was beautiful, a polished orator and a clever writer, possessed of good memory and judgment, in manner dignified and majestic. It is generally acknowledged, even by those who are unfriendly towards him, that he was unfeignedly religious and strictly fulfilled his spiritual duties. He heard Mass and read his breviary daily, and fasted three times a week. His piety cannot truly be described as deep or spiritual, but that does not justify the continual repetition of his alleged remark, how much we and our family have profited by the legend of Christ is sufficient to all ages. John Bale, the apostate English Carmelite, the first to give currency to these words in the time of Queen Elizabeth, was not even a contemporary of Leo. Among the many sayings of Leo X that have come down to us, there is not one of a sceptical nature. In his private life he preserved as Pope the irreproachable reputation that he had borne when a cardinal. His character shows a remarkable mingling of good and bad traits. The fame of Leo X is due to his promotion of literature, science and art. Under him, Rome became more than ever the centre of the literary world. From all parts, wrote Cardinal Riario in 1515 to Erasmus at Rotterdam, men of letters are hurrying to the eternal city, their common country, their support and their patroness. Poets were especially numerous in Rome, and few princes have been so lauded in verse as Leo X. He lavished gifts, favours, positions, titles, not only on real poets and scholars, but often on poetasters and commonplace jesters. He esteemed particularly the papal secretaries Bembo and Sadoletto, both celebrated poets and prose writers. Bembo charmed everyone by his polish and wit. His classic Ciceronian letters exhibit a remarkably varied intercourse with almost all the celebrities of his day. Among other things, he prepared a critical edition of Dante's works, and was a zealous collector of manuscripts, books, and works of art. His conduct was not in accord with his position as papal notary, Count Palatine, and incumbent of numerous benefices, for he was worldly and self-indulgent. Sadoletto was quite another man. He led a pure and spotless life, was a model priest, united in himself the different phases of ancient and modern culture, and was an ardent enthusiast for antiquity. In elegance and polish he was in no way inferior to Bembo. Among the Latin poets of Medici in Rome, we may briefly mention Vida, who composed a poem of great merit, the Christiade, and was extolled by his contemporaries as the Christian Virgil. San Nazaro, author of an epic poem on the birth of Christ, which is a model of style. The Carmelite Spagnolo Mantovano, with his calendar of feasts. Ferreri, who in the most naive way recast the hymns in the breviary with heathen terms, images, and allusions. The total number of these poets exceeds 100, and the Lampoon of 1521 says they are more numerous than the stars in heaven. Most of them have fallen into well-deserved oblivion. This is equally true of the contemporary Italian poetry, more prolific than notable. Among the Italian poets, Trissino wrote a tragedy, Sofonispa, and an epic, L'Italia liberata dai Gotti, but had no real success with either, in spite of earnest purpose and beauty of language. Ricciolet, a relative of the Pope, 
whose clever and sympathetic didactic poem on bees met with great approval from his contemporaries owed his reputation chiefly to an inferior work the tragedy of rosmonda the celebrated improvisatore to baldeo wrote in both latin and italian towards ariosto the pope was remarkably harsh archaeology received great encouragement one of its most distinguished representatives was manetti in fifteen twenty one the first collection of roman topographical inscriptions appeared and introduced a new era important progress was due to the works of the learned antiquary fulvio fulvio calvo castiglione and raphael had planned an archaeological survey of ancient rome with accompanying text raphael's early death abruptly interrupted the work which was carried on by fulvio and calvo the greek language also found favour and encouragement aldus manutius the venetian publisher whose excellent and correct editions of greek classics became so popular was one of leo's protégés andreas ioannis lascaris and musurus were summoned from greece to rome and founded a greek college the medician academy moreover the pope encouraged the collection of manuscripts and books he recovered his family library which had been sold by the florentines in fifteen ninety four to the monks of san marco had it brought to rome and enforced the regulations of sixtus the fourth for the vatican library the most distinguished of his librarians was ingarami less indeed through any learned works than for his gift of eloquence he was called the cicero of his age and played an important role at court in fifteen sixteen he was succeeded by the bolognese humanist Beraldo. leo tried as nicholas v had previously done to increase the treasures of the vatican library and with this object sent emissaries in all directions even to scandinavia and the orient to discover literary treasures and either obtain them or borrow them for the purpose of making copies the results however were unimportant the roman university which had entered on decay was reformed but did not long flourish on the whole leo as a literary Mecenas, has been overrated by his biographer giovio and later panegyrists relatively little was accomplished partly on account of the constant lack of money and partly because of the thoughtlessness and haste which the pope often showed in distributing his favours he was in reality only a dilettante yet he gave an important stimulus to scientific and literary life and was a potent factor in the cultural development of the west more important results resulted from his promotion of art though he was unquestionably inferior in taste and judgment to his predecessor julius the second leo encouraged painting beyond all other branches of art pre-eminent in this class stand the immortal productions of raphael in fifteen o eight he had come to rome summoned by julius the second and remained there until his death in fifteen twenty the protection extended to this master genius is leo's most enduring claim on posterity raphael's achievements already numerous and important took on more dignity and grandeur under leo he painted sketched and engraved from antique works of art modelled in clay made designs for palaces directed the work of others by order of the pope gave advice and assistance alike to supervisors and workmen everything pertaining to art the pope turns over to raphael wrote an ambassador in fifteen eighteen this is not of course the place to treat raphael's prodigious activity we limit ourselves to brief mention of a few of his works he finished the decoration of the vatican halls or stanze begun under julius the second and in the third hall cleverly referred to leo the tenth by introducing scenes from the pontificates of leo the third and leo the fourth a more important commission was given to him to paint the cartoons for the tapestries of the sistine chapel the highest of raphael's achievements the most magnificent of them being st peter's miracle draught of fishes and st paul preaching in athens a third famous enterprise was the decoration of the vatican loggia done by raphael's pupils under his direction and mostly from his designs the most exquisite of his paintings are the wonderful sistine madonna and the transfiguration sculpture showed a marked decline under leo the tenth michelangelo offered his services and worked from fifteen sixteen to fifteen twenty on a marble facade for the church of san lorenzo in florence but did not finish it 
On the other hand, the Pope gave special attention and encouragement to the minor arts, for example, decorative carving, and furthered the industrial arts. The greatest and most difficult task of Leo was in the field of architecture, and was inherited from his predecessor, that is, the continuation of the new St. Peter's. Bramante remained its chief architect until his death in 1514. Raphael succeeded him, but in his six years of office little was done, much to his regret, through lack of means. We may now turn to the political and religious events of Leo's pontificate. Here the bright splendour that diffuses itself over his literary and artistic patronage is soon changed to deepest gloom. His well-known peaceable inclinations made the political situation a disagreeable heritage, and he tried to maintain tranquillity by exhortations, to which, however, no one listened. France desired to wreak vengeance for the defeat of 1512 and to reconquer Milan. Venice entered into an alliance with her, whereupon Emperor Maximilian, Spain and England in 1513 concluded a holy league against France. The Pope wished at first to remain neutral, but such a course would have isolated him, so he decided to be faithful to the policy of his predecessors, and sought accordingly to oppose the designs of France, but in doing so to avoid severity. In 1513 the French were decisively routed at Novara, and were forced to effect a reconciliation with Rome. The schismatic cardinals submitted, and were pardoned, and France then took part in the Lateran Council which Leo had continued. But success was soon clouded by uncertainty. France endeavoured to form an alliance with Spain, and to obtain Milan and Genoa by a matrimonial alliance. Leo feared for the independence of the Papal States, and for the so-called freedom of Italy. He negotiated on all sides without committing himself, and in 1514 succeeded in bringing about an Anglo-French alliance. The fear of Spain now gave way to the bugbear of French supremacy, and the Pope began negotiating, in a deceitful and disloyal manner, with France and her enemies simultaneously. Before he had decided to bind himself in one way or the other, Louis the Twelfth died, and the young and ardent Francis I succeeded him. Once more, Leo sought delay. He supported the League against France, but until the last moment hoped for an arrangement with Francis. But the latter, shortly after his descent upon Italy, won the great victory of Marignano, 13th to the 14th of September, 1515, and the Pope now made up his mind to throw himself into the arms of the most Christian king and beg for mercy. He was obliged to alter his policy completely, and to abandon to the French king Palma and Piacenza, which had been united with Milan. An interview with King Francis at Bologna resulted in the French Concordat, 1516, that brought with it such important consequences for the Church. The pragmatic sanction of Bourges, 1438, deeply inimical to the papacy, was revoked. But the Pope paid a high price for this concession when he granted to the king the right of nomination to all the sees, abbeys, and priories of France. Through this, and other concessions, for example, that pertaining to ecclesiastical jurisdiction, the royal influence over the French church was assured. Great discontent resulted in France among the clergy and in the parliaments. The abolition of the pragmatic sanction, drawn up in compliance with the decrees of the Council of Basel, affected the adherence of the conciliar system of church government. The abolition of free ecclesiastical elections affected grievously the interests of many, and opposition to the Concordat was maintained for centuries. The advantage to the Church and the Pope of such a great sacrifice was now that France, hitherto schismatical in attitude, now stood firmly bound to the Holy See, which thus turned aside the danger of complete estrangement. However, the way in which the French crown abused its control over the Church led, at a later period, to great evils. Meanwhile, the Lateran Council, continued by Leo after his elevation to the papacy, was nearing its close, having issued numerous and very timely decrees, for example, against the false philosophical teachings of the Paduan professor Pietro Pomponazzi, who denied the immortality of the soul. The encroachments of pagan humanism on the spiritual life were met by the simultaneous rise of a new order of philosophical and theological studies. 
in the ninth session was promulgated a bull that treated exhaustively of reforms in the curia and the church abbeys and benefices were henceforth to be bestowed only on persons of merit and according to canon law provisions of benefices and consistorial proceedings were regulated ecclesiastical depositions and transfers made more difficult commendatory benefices were forbidden and unions and reservations of benefices also dispensations for obtaining them were restricted measures were also taken for reforming the curial administration and the lives of cardinals clerics and the faithful the religious instruction of children was declared a duty blasphemers and incontinent negligent or simoniac ecclesiastics were to be severely punished church revenues were no longer to be turned to secular uses the immunities of the clergy must be respected and all kinds of superstition abolished the eleventh session dealt with the cure of souls particularly with preaching these measures unhappily were not thoroughly enforced and therefore the much needed genuine reform was not realized towards the close of the council fifteen seventeen the noble and highly cultured layman gianfrancesco pico della mirandola delivered a remarkable speech on the necessity of a reform of morals his account of the moral condition of the clergy is saddening and reveals the many and great difficulties that stood in the way of a genuine reform he concluded with the warning that if leo the tenth left such offences longer unpunished and refused to apply healing remedies to these wounds of the church it was to be feared that god himself would cut off the rotten limbs and destroy them with fire and sword that very year this prophetic warning was verified the salutary reforms of the lateran council found no practical acceptance pluralism commendatory benefices and the granting of ecclesiastical dignities to children remained customary leo himself did not scruple to set aside repeatedly the decrees of the council the roman curia then much despised and against which so many invade with violence remained as worldly as ever the pope was either unwilling or not in a position to regulate the unworthy and immoral conduct of many of the roman courtiers the political situation absorbed his attention and was largely responsible for the premature close of the council in march fifteen sixteen emperor maximilian crossed the alps to make war on the french and venetians the pope followed his usual course of shifting and dissimulation at first when events seemed favourable for the french he supported francis but his former double dealing had left francis in such ill humour that he now adhered to an anti-papal policy whereupon leo adopted an unfriendly attitude towards the king their relations were further strained a propos of the duchy of urbino during the french invasion the duke of urbino had withheld the assistance which he was in duty bound to render the pope who now exiled him and gave the title to his nephew lorenzo de medici the french king was highly displeased with the papal policy and when francis i and maximilian formed the alliance of cambrai in fifteen seventeen and agreed on a partition of upper and central italy pope leo found himself in a disagreeable position in part by reason of his constant vacillation he had drifted into a dangerous isolation added to which the duke of urbino reconquered his duchy to crown all other calamities came a conspiracy of cardinals against the pope's life the ringleader cardinal petrucci was a young worldly ecclesiastic who thought only of money and pleasure he and the other cardinals who had brought about leo's election made afterwards such numerous and insistent demands that the pope could not yield to them other causes for discontent were found in the unfortunate war with urbino and in the abolition of the election capitulations and the excessive privileges of the cardinals petrucci bore personal ill-will towards the ungrateful pope who had removed his brother from the government of siena he tried to have the pope poisoned by a physician but suspicion was aroused and the plot was betrayed through a letter the investigation implicated cardinals sauli riario sodorini and castellesi they had been guilty at least of listening to petrucci and perhaps had desired his success though their full complicity was not actually proved petrucci was executed and the others punished by fines riario paid the enormous sum of a hundred and fifty thousand ducats 
the affair throws a lurid light on the degree of corruption in the highest ecclesiastical circles unconcerned by the scandal he was giving leo took advantage of the proceeding to create thirty-one new cardinals thereby obtaining an entirely submissive college and also money to carry on the unlucky war with urbino not a few of these cardinals were chosen on account of the large sums they advanced but this wholesale appointment also brought several virtuous and distinguished men into the sacred college and it was further important because it definitely established the superiority of the pope over the cardinals the war with urbino encouraged by francis i and maximilian for the purpose of increasing leo's difficulties was finally brought to a close after having cost enormous sums and emptied the papal treasury lorenzo de medici remained in possession of the duchy fifteen seventeen faithful to the ancient tradition of the holy see from the very beginning of his reign leo zealously advocated a crusade against the turks and at the close of the war with urbino took up the cause with renewed determination in november fifteen seventeen he submitted an exhaustive memorial to all the princes of europe and endeavoured to unite them in a common effort but in vain the replies of the powers proved widely dissimilar they were suspicious of one another and each sought naturally to realize various secondary purposes of its own leo answered a threatening letter from the sultan by active exertions religious processions were held a truce of five years was proclaimed throughout christendom and the crusade was preached fifteen eighteen the pope showed real earnestness but his great plan miscarried through lack of cooperation on the part of the powers moreover cardinal wolsey lord chancellor of england thought of the pope's peaceful efforts and thus dealt a grievous blow to the international prestige of the papacy when the crusade was preached in germany it found the large section of the people strongly predisposed against the curia and furnished them with an occasion to express their views in plain terms it was believed that the curia merely sought to obtain more money one of the numerous spiteful pamphlets issued declared that the real turks were in italy and that these demons could only be pacified by streams of gold the good cause was gradually merged with an important political question the succession to the imperial throne maximilian sought the election of his grandson charles of spain a rival appeared in the person of francis i and both he and charles vied with each other in seeking to win the pope's favour by repeated assurance of their willingness to move against the turks the event of the election relegated the crusade to the background in fifteen nineteen the pope realized that there was no longer any prospect of carrying out his design leo's attitude towards the imperial succession was influenced primarily by his anxiety concerning the power and independence of the holy see and the so-called freedom of italy neither candidate was acceptable to him charles if possible less than francis owing to the preponderance of power that must result from his accession the pope would have preferred a german electoral prince that of saxony or later the elector of brandenburg he sailed as usual with two compasses held both rivals at bay by a double game played with matchless skill and even succeeded in concluding simultaneously an alliance with both the deceitfulness and insincerity of his political dealings cannot be entirely excused either by the difficult position in which he was placed or by the example of his secular contemporaries maximilian's death january fifteen nineteen ended the pope's irresolution first he tried to defeat both candidates by raising up a german elector then he worked zealously for francis i in the endeavour to secure his firm friendship in case charles became emperor an event which grew daily more likely only at the last moment when the election of charles was certain and unavoidable did leo come over to his side after the election he watched in great anxiety the attitude the new emperor might assume the most important occurrence of leo's pontificate and that of gravest consequence to the church was the reformation which began in fifteen seventeen we cannot enter into a minute account of this movement the remote cause of which lay in the religious political and social conditions of germany it is certain however that the seeds of discontent amid which luther threw his firebrand had been germinating for centuries the immediate cause was bound up with the odious greed for money displayed by the roman curia 
and shows how far short all efforts at reform had hitherto fallen. Albert of Brandenburg, already Archbishop of Magdeburg, received, in addition, the Archbishopric of Mainz and the Bishopric of Halberstadt, but in return was obliged to collect ten thousand ducats, which he was taxed over and above the usual confirmation fees. To indemnify him, and to make it possible to discharge these obligations, Rome permitted him to have preached in his territory the plenary indulgence promised all those who contributed to the new St. Peter's. He was allowed to keep one-half the returns, a transaction which brought dishonour on all concerned in it. Added to this, abuses concerned during the preaching of the indulgence. The money contributions, a mere accessory, were frequently the chief object, and the indulgences for the dead became a vehicle of inadmissible teachings. That Leo X, in the most serious of all the crises which threatened the Church, should fail to prove the proper guide for her, is clear enough from what has been related above. He recognised neither the gravity of the situation, nor the underlying causes of the revolt. Vigorous methods of reform might have proved an efficacious antidote, but the Pope was deeply entangled in political affairs, and allowed the imperial election to overshadow the revolt of Luther. Moreover, he gave himself up unrestrainedly to his pleasures, and failed to grasp fully the duties of his high office. The Pope's last political efforts were directed to expanding the states of the Church, establishing thereby a dominating power in central Italy by means of the acquisition of Ferrara. In 1519 he concluded a treaty with Francis I against Emperor Charles V. But the selfishness and encroachments of the French and the struggle against the Lutheran movement induced him soon to unite with Charles, after he had again resorted to his double-faced method of dealing with both rivals. In 1521, Pope and Emperor signed a defensive alliance for the purpose of driving the French out of Italy. After some difficulty, the Allies occupied Milan and Lombardy. Amid the rejoicings over these successes, the Pope died suddenly of a malignant malaria. His enemies are wrongly accused of having poisoned him. The magnificent Pope was given a simple funeral, and not until the reign of Paul III was a monument erected to his memory in the church of the Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. It is cold, prosaic, and quite unworthy of such a connoisseur as Leo. The only possible verdict on the pontificate of Leo X is that it was unfortunate for the church. Sigismondo Tizio, whose devotion to the Holy See is undoubted, writes truthfully. In the general opinion, it was injurious to the church that her head should delight in plays, music, the chase and nonsense, instead of paying serious attention to the needs of his flock and mourning over their misfortunes. Von Roymont says, pertinently, Leo X is in great measure to blame for the fact that faith in the integrity and merit of the papacy, in its moral and regenerating powers, and even in its good intentions, should have sunk so low that men could declare extinct the old true spirit of the Church. End of article on Pope Leo X by Clemens Loeffler From the Catholic Encyclopedia, 1913 Recording by Algie Pug